All right. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. Um, tonight's event is Populism uh, in the Time of Trump. Uh, we have with us American Affairs and the Nation. Um, but before we go ahead and get started, I introduce the moderator, just some announcements. We have beer and wine on sale. We do take card and cash. Also, Descent um, has uh, availability for, to buy subscriptions and sign up for their newsletter. We'll be passing around um, a sign-up sheet to be in uh, Versos, Muftas, and um, Descent's uh, event sign-up. Um, and on to that, we have um, with us our moderator for tonight is Maryam Jamshidi. Uh, Maryam is the founding editor of Mufta Magazine, um, and she teaches at NYU Law. Um, if you all have questions at the end, there will be a Q&A, so we ask you to hold it till then. Um, afterwards, feel free to stay for drinks, beer, wine, meet your friends, make friends with your enemies if you'd like. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. Let me put my glasses on so I can identify. I see all your beautiful faces. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight to um, what I think will be um, an, an interesting, potentially um, contentious, potentially aggravating debate, debate about what it means to sort of be a populist or what does populism mean um, in the age of Donald Trump. Um, so obviously I think we're all pretty aware of the political situation in this country um, and around the world in terms of the sort of re resurgence, let's say, of, of populist rhetoric. Um, and so we are going to have representatives from the left and the right I guess, um, talk about this. So on my right are, is the left. Um, we have Sarah Leonard, who is an editor at uh, The Nation, as well as Descent. We also have Tim Shank, an editor at Descent. And then on my left is the right, um, starting with um, Julius Krein, uh, ed the editor of the new publication uh, called American Affairs, and then next to him, his deputy editor. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking out on your first name after going over it with you forever, Gladden Pappen, uh, who also teaches at the University of Notre Dame uh, in the political science department. So um, I'm going to stop talking. Each of our panelists will speak for about five minutes, giving their perspective on populism in the time of Trump. Um, and then we'll have a debate and then a Q&A to follow. All right, so let's get going. So the right will begin. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks to Descent and Verso for hosting. Um, I really can't actually overstate how pleased both of us are to be at uh, Verso Books. Um, reading many Verso volumes on the right, it was always there was a, a guilty pleasure in that. And uh, here we are, so <laughs> very exciting. Uh, now, I realize that this event um, has been advertised as a debate, and the boxing gloves and everything, it's very dramatic. Uh, but I'm going to use uh, my time, actually, to argue that the most important aspect of today's politics uh, is actually how much we agree, both on certain philosophic perspectives as well as actual policy programs. Theoretically, we are supposed to represent the far right and the far left, polar opposites of the spectrum. How is it then that we actually agree on so much, including uh, revising our trade policy to uh, focus more uh, on domestic workers, um, support for universal health care, less foreign policy interventionism, uh, better infrastructure, concern over inequality, skepticism of a consumerist and atomistic culture, uh, and the desire I think, to repoliticize uh, a lot a lot of issues and allow for um, seemingly radical political possibilities beyond the technical bureaucratic politics uh, we have grown accustomed to. Read, for example, the essays of Wolfgang Streeck uh, or Chantal Mouffe in Europe uh, and compare them, the, the, from the left obviously, and compare them with the essays, uh, an essay that we just published by Pierre Manon, uh, who is an unimpeachably rightist background, uh, the similarities are striking. 
I just actually read uh, a nice review of The Handmaid's Tale in Jack O'Ban, um, which could have been, would have been perfectly at home uh, in, in many right-wing magazines. And a similar review of the same thing by a rightist author um, that made all the same points. Uh, that, that is the reality. Um, and the, the reality is that it's, we actually here, I think, are not, um, we're not the left and right. Uh, but we have not yet become the new center, even though I suspect we have more in common with each other than either of us do with the self-proclaimed centers uh, of our parties. Um, it is precisely the uh, center that is composed of or, or based on a fanatical adherence to the ideology of neoliberalism, if I can use that word. Uh, and the task for those of us opposed to uh, that form of liberalism, call it the communitarian left and right, is precisely to develop a consciousness of this reality and our common goals and to begin to act on them. That is, in my view, the only alternative uh, to the current politics of there is no alternative, if I can use the leftist jargon, which I rather like, actually. Um, now, certainly, of course, uh, I'm not actually talking about the current administration specifically, I'm, I'm outlining a, a much longer term horizon and certain aspects, uh, or th there's certainly areas of disagreement that we can find. Uh, and those need to be navigated and negotiated and, and hopefully we can begin to do that tonight. But from my perspective, these disagreements are mostly tactical and second order concerns. I'm um, glad here is the expert on the timely death of conservative fusionism for the last half century, uh, and, and maybe he'll get into that. But I think the disagreement between us is perhaps uh, is no greater and perhaps much less uh, than the disagreements between the members of the conservative fusionist coalition that actually was quite successful for many years. And if in 40 years from now, uh, we fixed our economy and restored a more uh, communitarian civic culture and politics, then we can go back to fighting about those areas of disagreements. But as of today, I firmly believe uh, that we are the new center and we need to start acting like it. Uh, thank you very much, Julius, and thank you to Verso Books and everyone else for inviting us here. Um, I find that I prepared some of the same points that, sorry, I find that I uh, prepared some of the same points, um, but as we were walking over here, um, we, were, we were saying, um, I was saying to Julius, it would probably be hard, it might be hard to convince the Verso Books people how excited we are to be here, uh, but in fact we are. Uh, and if I sound incoherent at any point the, tonight, it's not just because of ideology, uh, but because I flew from Paris just for the event. Um, and a few years ago, I think it, I, I did have the feeling a few years ago uh, when Julius and I and a few other people were regularly reading, uh, particularly, I think we, we went through a phase of reading and discussing most of the works of Baudrillard, which were, which were republished. Not all of his books were published by Verso, um, but heck, a heck of a lot of them were. Um, and they're highly relevant books. In fact, I was at a, I was, I, I gave a, I gave, I've, I've, I've been, I, I've given a few talks on Baudrillard at um, right-wing conferences in, in past years. Um, and I just gave one, not at a, not at a right-wing conference, but just at an academic conference uh, earlier this year. And, and in order to do that, I reread his book, uh, America, uh, which was his travelogue, um, traveling through the US in about 1985. Um, and I found that he had this, uh, I mean, with Baudrillard, I can always only, I, I, I only really feel like I understand it while I'm reading the book. And then as soon as I try to translate Baudrillard into like, sort of technical language or, or, to, or to rephrase it um, in academic terms, since it's kind of an, an impressionistic writing style, I usually fail. But what I was impressed by uh, in, uh, in his book, America, is that he said that, um, he said he, 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 he already had kind of his finger um, on the phenomenon of parts of America that were being left behind. Uh, and, he, and not only America, but other parts of the developed world um, and instead of calling them you know, the, the first or the third world, he said there's, there's a new world that's kind of part of the first world, which is called the fourth world, uh, which are the, disin he called them the disintensified zones. 
Um, and it seemed to me that, that, that um, you know, although a lot of people who were reading you know, Baudrillard's book America in 1986 were like, who is this crazy you know, French theorist who's corrupting American universities, uh, along with all the other U French and European theorists, um, but I found that actually, th at least that, that, that aspect reads quite, quite well, um, which, is, which is, you know, so much as to say that it's very important for us to have this discussion um, because very few other people are having this kind of cross-partisan discussion. Uh, and basically, to, re to reiterate Julius's point, um, you know, as he said, you know, we can go back to disagreeing over, you know, particular, all, all sorts of particular matters uh, once the possibility of real political action is restored, but right now that uh, that that uh, that possibility is partly foreclosed to us. Um, and in particular, if we don't have these sorts of discussions, um, then the kind of you can call it the, the neoliberal strategy or the or the globalist strategy um, of separating parts of the left and right uh, on cultural matters. Uh, will only feed into the, the sense, such as you got in, in France in the most recent election, um, that the sort of um, the, the globalist class or the managerial class is the only le legitimate representative of centrism uh, and everyone else disagrees on the left and on the right. Um, and, al and although, um, although of course, the, you know, the, the potential for any sort of synthesis uh, between between uh, left and right on either th on either certain economic matters or or even the or or even the restoration of political sovereignty or something like that might have difficult um, difficult obstacles which we'll get to. Um, it seemed to me that I mean the, the, it was very funny watching the watching the speeches after watching the speeches after the second round of the um, of the of, of of the French election. Um, you know, many people had pointed out that uh, Marine Le Pen's economic program uh, had probably more in common with that of Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, than it did with uh, than it did with François Fillon, um, and so um, and, and 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 nevertheless, the fanatical center seems to have won in France, uh, and it's won it's won many other places as well. In this article by Pierre Menant that uh, that, that that Julius mentioned. Uh, he, he, he notes that in an earlier day, he's describing French politics, but I think it could probably be applied, um, maybe, well, we'll leave that question, we'll, it could probably be applied to other political contexts as well. But he said in an earlier age, both the left and the right were populist in a sense. They identified a different, they, they identified a different people, um, the right always being associated with the national uh, uh, people and the left being associated with the with the people of a certain kind of class, um, but nevertheless there was there was a time at least in France uh, when when both um, both the political left and political right were populist in this sense, um, and although you know although this conversation is only one one sort of step or instance in in the discussion of how this um, how the, any how any sort of um, one, yeah, how, how that how that how that question might develop. The only the only other thing I would say here um, is that one is is is, is that the elements of both the left and the right have to realize. I guess this is something that the left already realizes or has talked about for a long time. Um, but the the right also has to realize that there is a kind of class war uh, occurring in in um, in uh, developed countries. Uh, but instead, uh, both left and right have spent a lot of the last 25 years, at least since the since the end of the Cold War, talking about the culture war instead. Uh, and it occurred to me if the, if I had been really clever at age 10, um, I could have uh, written a book quite like Baudrillard's book, uh, The Gulf War Never Happened, which consisted of three articles that he had published in Liberation uh, over the course of the first Gulf War, called The Gulf War Will Not Happen, uh, The Gulf War Is Not Happening, and then finally, The Gulf War did not happen, and I suppose if I had been really clever on, uh, you know, ju just just before uh, the 1992 GOP convention, you might have said something like, "The culture war will not happen," and then later, "The culture war will not happen," and then finally, "The culture war culture war did not happen." And what do I mean by that? 
Well, I think it's pretty clear that the culture war, uh, at, least in, at least in the way that we spoke, we spoke about it, which was never really a war, um, came to an end with the Obergefell decision. Uh, and at least on the right, the, the only candidate who happened to be the candidate who won the election, only one candidate realized that or admitted it. Um, and in the meantime, during the entire period in which we were talking about the culture war, which, do, which does indicate you know, real issues that's, that divide and will still divide right and left to the extent that they are, that they are prominent or not, um, during that during that entire time, um, the sort of phenomena which 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 created the um, you know economic dislocations which are now manifesting themselves politically passed itself off in completely non-political terms. Um, so both in in a, in a way, both the left and right political parties. Uh, were sort of advertising aspects of the culture war uh, to their own constituencies while actually doing nothing about it politically. And in the meantime, uh, the kind of globalist economic revolution uh, proceeded on, on non-political grounds as though it were the expression of economic logic. Uh, and so here we are today. Great. I want to start by thanking Verso for hosting us and Julius and Gladden for agreeing to come down here into the lion's den to have this conversation. I have a lot of respect for that choice. So, Actually, what I'm about to say, the comments are pre-written, but they track um, in lots of ways um, issues that you guys were discussing. Because basically, I agree. As I see it, the question that we're here to discuss is what conservatives who loathe Paul Ryan have in common with socialists who can't stand Hillary Clinton. The answer, I think, and here I'm going to depart with you, Julius, is I think not that much. But before getting into our differences, I want to explain why I feel this is a conversation worth having. Whatever our disagreements, I can second Julius's description of the Republican Party as, quote, little more than a jobs program for failed academics and journalists, close quote. <laughs> the same goes for your assessment of what a bipartisan coalition of elite governance has given us, skyrocketing income inequality, pointless wars, and a sense that we've lost something crucial in our democracy. Your honesty on these subjects encourages me to hold American affairs to a high standard. And here's where things get tricky. Now, Gladden, you were making a point just now about culture wars that you also um, discussed in the first issue, where you told us that, quote, the culture wars are essentially over. That's a really important argument for your, for your side, and I understand why you brought it up today. Because if, as you were just pointing out, if battles over social issues have ended, then the fight can shift to political economy, where populists on the left and the right might be able to find common cause. The problem, as I see it, is that the culture wars aren't over. They've just changed shape. The religious right is weakened, but the alt-right is surging. The Christian coalition might be exhausted. Breitbart isn't. In this fight, you're not allowed to call a truce on social issues in one breath if you're going to gripe about identity politics in the next, especially when identity politics means any discussions about the realities of racism in the United States. Without understanding this shift, I don't think of it as an end, I think of it as a shift in the culture wars, you can't understand Trump, because the man's basically a cultural studies seminar come to life. Now, Gladden, in your article, you credit Trump's victory to the loyalty and patriotism of middle America. Like most of the other people who have examined last year's election returns, I have a different view. Trump didn't crush identity politics. He embraced it, encouraging whites to assert membership in their tribe while providing just enough rhetorical cover that other voters would be able to vote, cast their ballots for him without feeling too guilty in front of their kids. Of course, not all of those voters wanted cover, which is one reason that hate crimes rose 20% last year. All of this points to a deeper error at the heart of the American Affairs Project. I was struck in your current issue by the Pierre Manon piece as well. And I agree, I, that, especially that definition of the different ways that left and right have interpreted the people, that the left's preferred unit of analysis has been class, and that the right's preferred unit of analysis has been the nation. Or at least that the right's preferred unit of, unit of analysis was the nation until the Davos crowd came along and like, sold out this like, long-standing tradition of the right. And as I see it, American Affairs is hoping to reclaim this nationalist vocabulary for the right to make nationalism great again. But I don't think it's going to be that easy. Nationalism has always, always been bound up with race. Historically, this has been the essential divide between left and right. Not class versus nation, but class versus race. Now, of course, racism alone isn't enough to win an election. But when combined with a host of other resentments, support from a spineless Republican establishment, again, seconding Julius on that point, a tragicomic Clinton campaign, and grievances from voters who really have been screwed, 
white nationalism made Donald Trump president. Which brings us to the most important subject. What do we do now? I believe that the great, the great question for our generation is whether it will be possible for us to create an egalitarian multiracial multi democracy, ideally while doing everything we can to stop the planet from being incinerated. Climate change, incidentally, is one of many cases we could point to where I don't think a politics of nationalism is going to cut it. But on almost every front, the biggest immediate obstacle facing us is Donald Trump. His manipulation of racial anxieties divides a working class that should be united against a common enemy, while his incompetence makes technocracy more appealing than anything Hillary Clinton could have done. It's not enough to play coy or claim neutrality about Trump. The more you postpone condemning him, the harder it becomes to build a democratic movement that might actually succeed. This ongoing disaster is all the more excruciating because in 2016, we saw an example of what such a movement might look like. The next time someone in this room is subjected to a lecture on how political correctness has ruined millennials, and I assume that'll be like two days for some of you, but ask why so many of the kids these days turned out to vote for Bernie Sanders. He won over 70% of the under 30 vote in the Democratic primary, giving him a total greater than Clinton and Trump combined. A democratic socialist built a multiracial coalition with a clear sense of what it was fighting. That achievement's not a solution to all our problems, but it is a start, and when you have that, why waste time with Trumpism? Now, um, so we've all said our thank yous, but I want to especially thank Dissent, which really um, conceived of this event and made it possible, um, and where I've been lucky enough to not only work, but I get to keep going home, which is really, really nice. Um, so I also wrote out my comments, which I don't usually do, but there's a, a lot um, that I wanted to touch on, um, having read through the American Affairs material um, and taking up uh, from the generous challenge of the American Affairs editors um, and really just picking up where my colleague Tim left off. Um, so sort of jumping off from there, I'll, I'll just note that a pretty diverse coalition to counter capital's upward redistribution had been growing, and it's not just Bernie Sanders, right? I think everyone in this room is paying attention. Um, in the last roughly six years, not very long at all, we've seen waves of organizing on the left. So we had Occupy and then Black Lives Matter, and then yes, the Bernie campaign, and now the explosive growth of organizations representing socialism, reproductive rights, immigrant rights, I've heard the tired phrase identity politics used to describe these movements, but that's just another way of saying they look like America. In fact, they look like its future. So consider millennials who voted for Bernie, as Tim mentioned. Um, and by 2032, the working class will be majority minority. So if you're a working class American being born right now in the US today, odds are you're not white. What's remarkable about this growing coalition is that it seeks to heal the divisions, um, you know, painfully and slowly, that have prevented working people from organizing against those who dominate them for a long time. So you see the Black Lives Matter movement producing a platform that has a sophisticated economic program and wraps up gender justice under its mantle. Democratic Socialists of America, still a pretty white organization, um, is off working on gentrification in Brooklyn and walking picket lines with AT&T workers. So this is, of course, what I see as a promising step forward. Now, many see Trump as a wave of the future, and I understand that. Uh, the man won an election despite relentless efforts to sabotage himself. And like Bernie, he became a vehicle for those who felt alienated and victimized by the political establishment. And we know and we should be glad that people are fed up with politics as they stand, but we should ask ourselves, is Trumpism really the best we can do? And when you have a journal where you have freedom to imagine and plan, why is this the agenda? American Affairs tells us that nationalism is the answer to our problems. They believe that capitalism isn't the problem, but what theorist James Burnham called the managerial elite, disloyal professional globalists with no ties to the nation, who are the real enemies exploiting the masses. And we can dig into this later, but sort of a cute dodge to avoid blaming capitalists and therefore replace class struggle with a nationalist one. So these elites have to be disciplined by nationalism. All the people I described earlier who have been fighting the excesses of capitalism for so long don't seem to be getting behind your plan and Trump's. 
Not only are Trump voters overwhelmingly white, but so is American affairs. A masthead of all white men, a first issue made of all white men, um, and a second issue that has managed to squeeze in one white woman. I wonder why. I missed one. Translator. Oh, she was a translator. Okay. One and a half. <laughs> Um, since you're all very erudite, I'm sure I don't have to puzzle out for you why people of color haven't flocked to a nationalist agenda. Nationalism in America is always accompanied by paranoid attempts to purge the agents within, interning Japanese Americans during World War II, attacking Sikhs of all people as we geared up for war in Afghanistan, um, and the hate crimes, of course, that we see today. Um, so when Trump stands up and says, these are my people, you know, the most beautiful people, the greatest people, it has that George Wallace ring to it, right? He doesn't mean all Americans. He means the people who are cheering his attacks on the rest of us, all under the guise of making America great again, which really raises the question, who's America? When you choose nationalism as your refuge from modernity, you exclude all but the only people who have ever truly loved American nationalism, white people, especially men. That's not what America looks like, though. I have the statistics. Um, that's your fantasy, the imaginary American community to whom you claim loyalty in your pages. It's a vision with a tenuous relationship to reality, one you can only see, ironically, with blinders on, the type they seem to distribute to serious Harvard men for some reason. After reading your essay, Julius, about Burnham, I read a sort of wonderful critique by Orwell of Burnham. And after considering several disastrous predictions Burnham made during World War II, all predicting the ultimate victory of whoever was winning at that moment, Orwell argues that this tendency had roots, quote, partly in cowardice and partly in the worship of power, which is not fully separable from cowardice. I would propose that American affairs is like Burnham in more ways than one. The contributors don't necessarily worship Trump, as I'm sure they'll tell you, though at least one has joined his odious administration. Most of the editors are content to play footsie. But they think that white nationalism is a great force that will shake up our elites because it won this time. And they're willing to get on board alongside all its ghastly baggage. It's a cheap, short-term, and cowardly political vision. Now, it's not polite to call someone else's journal a crypto white nationalist project, and my mom might be watching, but I'll cite your esteemed contributor, Michael Anton, who is a, national, a senior national security official in the Trump administration. He said just prior to your journal being born, in an essay called Toward a Sensible Coherent Trumpism, quote, Islam and the modern West are incompatible. He later moderates this in the same essay by saying, quote, not all Muslims are terrorists, blah, 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 close quote. Now, what's remarkable about this statement is not the casual racism. What's notable is that it conflates the modern West or America with Christianity, whiteness, certainly not with the people who actually live here. When American Affairs talks about nationalism, it's a proxy for a white America they wish existed, but doesn't and won't without something worse than internment. Just as William F. Buckley at the National Review struggled to make segregation respectable 60 years ago, will you make alt-right racism respectable by sticking it in a Harvard gown? Take it out of the hands of Milo and make it Tweety again? First is tragedy and then truly is farce. All right then, so, um, so let's start with um, probably the core issue um, that's sort of come up in the comments that were made, which is on the one hand, a desire by your publication and yourselves to put aside uh, issues of identity and race um, for the sake of uniting around 
economic issues, let's just say. There are some others as well, but economic issues seem to be at the forefront. Um, and then on the other side, the insistence that you cannot separate the two, that race and identity are extremely important in this country, that in fact, the reason Trump won was because of his play to identity issues. Um, and to just put a few numbers around it. So there have been a lot of surveys, there are always a lot of studies, um, and there are a lot on this issue in particular. And quite a few of them have concluded that um, the vote, so one statistic is that voters that made less than $50,000 a year voted for Hillary, that voters in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin who, uh, who named the economy as being their number one concern voted for Hillary. Uh, that of the uh, a Gallup poll that, that polled about 125,000 people found that those that voted for Trump were not those that had been left behind, were not those that had been um, betrayed by globalization. Um, so what do you make of those numbers? And in addition, um, the comments made by, by uh, our editors on this side about the role of race. Well, I certainly appreciate the very generous sentiments from that side of the table. Um, First off, just to be clear, I really don't care if you vote for Trump or not. You can resist Trump all day. You can do the protests and the marches and all that. Um, that's not what American Affairs is about. The Trump, to me, it's a, a sort of symptom of a deeper underlying change. It's a, it's an, his accomplishment is to show merely that the conventional modes of politics aren't necessarily going to be successful anymore. Um, but beyond that, I don't see him as sort of a leader, an intellectual leader, certainly, or, or even a sort of policy leader. Um, and, you know, if you want to vote somebody else, be my guest. I might, too. I don't know. Um, but uh, I do think there's something instructive, actually, in the Trump phenomenon, whereas even if you get Bernie elected, um, he's going to face the same sort of internal resistance in his party. There's going to be the same sort of... Uh, it, it'll be a little bit different because he's on the left, so its face will be different, but it, there will be all these kind of leaks and attacks and he's not really ready to be president, all that, all that stuff will be there too. And so I don't know why you would um, refuse uh, supporters on the right who might share that vision. Um, you know, with respect to the, first of all, um, <clears throat> I, I should let Gladden say this, but Gladden is actually a voting member of the Osage Tribal Nation, so uh, you know you shouldn't do violence against his heritage. Uh, and looking around the room here, if we're going to start counting faces, we're not going to do very good in this room either. Um, but I think the, the, ex the importance of the alt-right and that stuff has been grossly exaggerated. Um, I was talking actually to one one person who was a veteran of the New Left movements in the 60s and 70s, and he was saying how, and he'd been to a lot of Trump rallies and stuff, and he was saying how the media had kind of done the same thing where in the 60s they would go find the one Stalinist at the rally and then say, ah, these people are all, you know, Soviets. And uh, a lot of that, you know, I, I think the, first of all, like white nationalism is not even a real, I don't even know what that means, um, but the extent of people that actually believe in that or, you know, it's a, it's an extremely small number of group. I would say there are far more people that voted for Obama um, in 08 and 012 who ended up voting for Trump than there are any members of the, or devotees of the alt-right uh, or, you know, that movement um, and that stuff. The other thing on, on national, I mean, I would say if you want to get beyond the racial discrimination and that legacy, the only way to actually do that is through nationalism. Now, I know nationalism is a loaded term. It can mean uh, different things. I thought I had come up with this. It turns out Irving Kristol did, but he sort of defined nationalism as, you know, patriotism based on an idea of the future. Um, and you left out in your litany of the pathologies of American nationalism, you left out a very important one, which was, of course, Lincoln was a nationalist. Uh, and I would say, actually, in our history, um, you know, after, say, you know, the, the, the shared national enterprise of World War II and stuff like that, you tend to get um, a better sense of, of solidarity and over, overcoming uh, those things that might have otherwise existed. So um, we can debate that, and nationalism can mean different things, but that's the vision that I have of it. And a sense of sort of white tribal politics, I think, would be um, very bad for the country. And, I, you know, most people, I, yeah, the vast majority of people on the right think that, too. Um, Let's see. 
Yeah, I mean, the other thing, I, you know, is just if you want to have, if you want to oppose neoliberalism, if you want to have socialism or communitarianism, you need a community. Um, and how you define that, of course, is very important. Uh, but if you want to just have global individualism, then don't claim to be against the economic depredations that that social organization brings about. Uh, I think, um, I mean, you know, climate change, we can, we can talk about that later if we want. I think I'll stop there. I, I, <clears throat> I actually feel triggered by Julius's use of the term white tribal politics. Um, tribal politics is perfectly fine if you're talking about a tribe. Um, so at, at any rate, he correctly describes my background. Um, the, only, the, only th the, only, the only thing I would add is that I, I, uh, w when, when Sarah was saying, I now, I now forget the statistic because I'm not very good with statistics, um, but she said that at some point in the future, the working class in America will be uh, majority minority, and that's great. Um, and w w what I wonder is, w is whether the, the left, in this case, thinks that there's any possibility for you know, transracial solidarity in the working class, and if so, what would it look like? Uh, and I would pause it as my, as my provocation that when I said that the, that, the, um, that the culture wars ended with Obergefell, of course I meant that the, that the pseudo culture war um, in which nothing was actually decided politically but only through Supreme Court decisions ended at Obergefell. Um, and, that, and, that what happened after, and that what happened after that on the right was that uh, you know, members of the Republican Party, as I said, and I'm just reiterating this part, um, continued to, s to sell different forms of, uh, or use different forms of social conservatism in order to be uh, elected. But the left also made an error, uh, and not, I, I don't know if it's specifically after o Obergefell or what, uh, but, but the error, I think, was, was to, um, you know, you know the, 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 the left had been part of a great cause. Um, which was successfully realized with the Obergefell decision. Uh, and after that, because of the nature of progressivism, they had to find something else. Uh, and that seems to me, at least in, at least in college campuses in the last few years, uh, to, to have turned into an excessive search uh, for you know, small signs of racism and, and microaggression, et cetera. And my concern uh, is that the left might actually, you know, um, W without objecting to what um, to what they've said about um, you know Trump voters in some circumstances, the question would be: uh, Is it possible both to acknowledge uh, the forms of race, the, the real forms of racism that are still present in society and are, and, and which are uh, exploited politically? Um, but is there some way that they think th th that 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 both um, continuing to push the antagonism uh, between between, uh, between races through, you know, as, as I described it, sort of excessive identification of, of, of microscopic forms of racism um, might actually be preventing the form, formation of some solidarity within the working class. I was just gonna ask if before, I don't want if you could say what you mean by those microscopic forms, because that came up in your essay too, and I, I actually want to talk about that, but I wasn't, I want to just pin it down. So after Oberfeld, things have gotten too small. I, I assume you mean stuff like saying congratulations, you guys, is like some kind of terrible thing or something like that. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there have been these, these sort of university things that have put out like lists of microaggressions and they include things like saying, you know, congrat you can't say congratulations, you guys, because that might offend, you know, gotcha. females or whatever. Okay, so I'll take a first round, then Sarah. All right, great, I'll take a stab at it. On the point about the significance of the alt-right, I'd say that I'd buy the argument more about, so you know, comparing it to the 70s and the 60s when all of these, you know, the media would focus on radicals and turns out they didn't have any power. That would make more sense to me if Jimmy Carter had appointed the editor of the Daily Worker to be the senior counselor in the White House. But in our current case, I think that the lay of the land is different than the comparison lets on. On, just that's a story, and I thought the invocation of Lincoln was really fascinating, because if you go back and read the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which, you know, as good Straussians, I'm sure you guys have done several times, one of the things that's really striking is you see in some of the editions, they reprint the audience reactions 
to what they're saying. And there are these amazing moments when the audience just starts bursting out into chants of white men, white men, with seemingly no provocation. Well, actually, no, tons of provocation, because Lincoln and Douglas were both conceding the necessity of a government, thinking Douglas's words, like, of, by, and for white men, essentially. And of course, Lincoln takes a different road eventually. But focusing on one picture to the exclusion of the broader swath of American history, which before and after Lincoln is defined, two political parties based solidly upon white nationalism, erases a struggle that's necessary to grapple with in order to understand our own conditions. And this is where, I'll start by saying like why I think this is a conversation is, I see you two in American Affairs as a product of a journal of former conservatives who have, realized, who have rejected the line on political economy. So now, in order to get the coalition, all we need to do is get you to come over to the rest of our side on cultural issues. We're halfway there. The job is almost done. So this means that I have to make the case for the necessity of recognizing the significance of these cultural issues if we're going to build a successful coalition that's going to do something about the problems that you do acutely identify. That's the question. Like, it's a question of that you can't, you can't ally these issues as just tactics because one, they're bound up with some of the deepest questions about in American history, and as a consequence, they're essential to charting our path forward, which again, to repeat a point I made in the talk, is why taking a position on Trump is so crucial. You can't dodge the question. It is the decisive issue that we're facing at the moment. And unless you have a strategy that can inform that position, then I think it calls the entire project into question. Um, Sarah. Yeah, I, I, I would echo what you said. Um, and of course, with, with regard to Anton, he's not the one Stalinist in the crowd. He's one out of 10 contributors to the first issue of the journal. But w something that really jumped out at me was um, you referred to, to the necessity of community, of, of community for realizing a democratic project. And I think that's actually an interesting thing to delve into because that's heavily emphasized in your magazine. And it's also something that all leftists think about a lot. How do you organize except within communities? Um, something that really disrupts my community is when my neighbor gets deported or um, I don't know when someone is subjected to um, brutality by the police. These are things that happen commonly enough in Brooklyn, although less deportation here than some other places because of our politics. Um, and so this really comes down to what you consider your community to be. And so one thing I sort of wanted to, to sort of dig in on was we believe on the left in building communities through solidarity. And when we talk about, um, you know, when you talk about the problem with microaggressions, for example, that's a great way to not build solidarity. So what I mean by that is that I actually don't think the left spends a lot of time, think, at least in my organizing experience, which is just a small part of what many other people do, do not sit around debating um, whether someone said you guys and therefore needs to be expelled. I think that the obsession of the right with idiosyncrasies of college campuses betrays an infantilism on the right, because why else would you be obsessed with debating 20-year-olds um, instead of your peers? So when we think about building coalitions, there are lots of examples of how multiracial coalitions are being formed in America. And of course, they're difficult to form because we inherit an incredible legacy of racism, which is reproduced in various ways across generations, not only in terms of belief and ideology, but in the statistics we all know about housing and wealth and so forth. They're very concrete. The idea of referring to it as just a legacy is ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, you can look at any number of things that are happening in the U.S. right now. So um, the Fight for 15 campaign, which I would add, you know, to say that the left was obsessed with the Oberfeld decision alone, and then once we got gay marriage, you know, like the left was over. Like, the number of campaigns that were operating during that time for a range of other things, including fair wages, um, is enormous. Um, so th that was one particularly diverse campaign because so many people who work in the fast food industry are um, low income workers of color. Um, recently, I would point to actually, um, Black Lives Matter has really brought to the fore the problem of racism in the criminal justice system, particularly cops, but more recently prosecutors. Um, and so there have been a couple of DA elections that have been fascinating for the ways in which they take the priorities of a predominantly black movement and they bring into that movement 
a large number of white activists, immigration activists, um, a pretty wide range of community members, and they got rid of their DA in Philadelphia, they got rid of their DA in Chicago, with coalitions like this, all of which include labor, working people. Um, and so if you want examples of coalitions, they abound and they're growing and they're fascinating to study um, and to try to replicate. But to simply say, you know, that they don't exist or, you know, they could never come together because the left is obsessed with microaggressions just betrays an ignorance of any left outside of a college campus. And a follow-up point on Gladden's question about the possibility of left political organizing across racial lines, thinking about what the future of American politics might look like. One example that a lot of people have been pointing to recently is California, where you see a country that went through a demographic transition that looks like it's going to be in the rest of our future um, pretty soon. And one hopeful sign from my perspective is the utter evisceration of the Republican Party in that state. Like once we've taken care of that threat, then you guys can come over and we can deal with like neo with the neoliberal side together. But it doesn't seem if we're looking for or sort of terrifying omens of what uh, truly multiracial democracy would look like, that California, the best instant, one of the best instances we have, is going to give you that image. Now, there can be problems for other reasons, but just politically, it seems to me a useful point to make. So uh, to get away um, for a second from the really important issues that we're, we, we've been discussing and talk about some of the policy-based issues um, that, that your magazine is focused on. Um, and let's take immigration um, as a starting point. So again, the call is to bring, to bring together the left, the right, whatever you want to call it, around shared issues, a share, or, or shared perspectives on issues. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I know that your magazine is just getting started, but um, looking at what you have put out there so far on immigration, and, and it wasn't very much, I think I just saw a blurb, um, you embraced a Canadian model which I'd love for you to explain, um, and uh, and uh, and also, uh, I think mentioned rejecting the H-1B visa as uh, potentially causing a downward, causing downward pressure on on wages and otherwise not being a clear con contributor to American productivity. Um, what is how do you see the position that you're staking out on immigration as one that members of the left can embrace? Well. Um just to start with, the, the Canadian system basically assigns um, sort of points or priority based on a person's skills or whatever they bring to the country. So uh, it basically prioritizes high-skilled immigrants. Um, That's not the good ones. I do, I do see, I do, I do believe that the country's immigration policy, um, like, like basically all of its policy decisions, should be designed to benefit the citizens currently. Um, what I would say we have now is though is actually it's not even, we don't even right now have a loose immigration policy. We simply have no immigration policy at all. Uh, and it's really the worst possible outcome, especially if you're concerned about lower wages. You can just go back and read Milton Friedman's work on the desire to import illegal immigrants um, to undermine uh, any welfare state. And, and uh, you know, it's not just me, I think there, there are serious people on the left um, here in Europe, elsewhere, who have pointed out the basic reality uh, that uh, if you have unlimited immigration, it makes it very difficult to sustain a, um, a healthy welfare state. Uh, so I, I have, you know, I'm very open to debating the exact contours of what our immigration policy should be, but there has to be one, um, and there has to be a, a rules-based system. And I think um, once you dealt with that, actually a lot of the Concerns about deportation and stuff would would um, would abate quite naturally, uh, and on the H-1B, yeah, I think um, it, it, again that's another area where our immigration system seems perfectly designed with the benefit of employers and depressing wages in mind, whereby um, bringing in an immigrant, tying them to a specific employer so they can't get another job without losing their visa and, and all things like that. Um, it, it seems uh, probably the worst way to do it from a wages perspective. Um, on the question of immigration, I was actually I was struck by your citing of the Canadian examples model as well, I, if for no other reason than for the fact that I think some 20% of the Canadian population is foreign born compared to 13% in the United States, which at least from our perspective of building a multiracial democracy seems all to the good. But I was struck that you would adopt that for yourself. And I think on the question of the priority of immigration more generally, 
I mean, it's one of those issues that just seems like it's going to continue to be social science to death, its effect on wages. Like you can point to one study on Miami workers that's been cited quite generally on how it has an effect. I think the argument was that it could push down wages for non-college educated workers, uh, native born workers up to 30%. And then I could point to a study from the Center for Global Development just this week that challenged that assumption pretty profoundly and concluded that the overall assessment was, if anything, negligible. I think the more important thing that matters um, and something that we've known at least since Piketty, if not before, is that the real issue to focus on is the skyrocketing economic inequality brought about in this country by the explosion of compensation for the 1%, which is not happening because people are being brought in to pick strawberries in California. That's not what Goldman Sachs executive comp salaries, com executive compensation is tied to. If we want to focus on the issues that truly matter with the limited resources that we have, I think immigration is at best a distraction from the more fundamental fight that we need to be waging. Right. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I, I mean, I would echo that, and I think it's um, sort of peculiar to aim at fixing the economic condition of working people in the Midwest by banning immigration, um, which is not aimed at their jobs, while ignoring the fact that the 0.1% has usurped a massive amount of the wealth and to develop an analysis at which it is not core to take back the wealth from the people who took all the wealth seems confusing at best. Can, can I just interject here? Um, I talked about immigration because she asked me about it. I wasn't like trying to make it a priority. No, and I'm please. happy to ask you about taxes now if you yeah, want. Yeah, no, I, I just, I, I, I sense there's this desire to sort of call us a white nationalist and, and like that's the debate. Um, I don't know why. Uh, and, you I, know, I, I've I, never said it. You know, no. the reason we only I, wrote like I, a quarter paragraph on it is because we actually do see it as a much smaller element of the much larger I picture. To, to be so clear, I, I'm just trying to, to say be, that, like, you know, we can focus on these differences, but we don't have to. Well, to be clear, I'm actually trying to focus on policy yeah. issues and immigration. So your magazine sets out five or six different issues that you're focused on. Immigration is one of them, right? The next one I want to ask you about is taxes. I, I, if so, I could just interject briefly, because sure. Julius. I wouldn't have wanted to debate you if I thought you were white nationalist. Obviously, I don't. Like, this would not be a conversation worth having if that were the case. I think that your magazine has offered an incorrect analysis of the state of American politics today, but I think you did it in good faith. I think this is a conversation worth having. I'm just trying to persuade you that this is an important force worth dealing with so that we can actually start building on common ground. But until you do that, I don't think we can have that conversation. That's the point. I'm not charging you with that at all. But I mean, what, what do you want me to say? So. That I'm right? Uh, uh, no, I mean, because, I, I mean, I think, I think... I think we can have this. We can go back and forth on, on this issue, and I don't think it's productive. I think you want to have a, a conversation about policy, right? So let's have a conversation about policy. So let's talk about taxes. What is your position on taxes? I find policy really boring, actually. Um, <laughs> well, you started the wrong magazine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You should read it sometime. Um, we... Uh, we uh, uh, yeah, as, as we outlined, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, I think I see I see corporate taxes is kind of bound up with uh, trade policy, um, and and therefore I you know would be inclined to support a lower nominal corporate rate, um, which would be countered by uh, a VAT, a more traditional VAT, um, so much like most of the world does. Lower uh, the corporate taxes. Lower corporate taxes, higher VAT. Um, and what about or new, well, new create a new VAT. What uh, about personal taxes? And taxes personal on taxes. Um, you know this this issue, the importance of this issue, especially on the right, uh, as the cure all for all economic ills. Of course, um, we don't agree with that, and especially when we're having these supposedly bitter debates over 39 versus 35 percent top corporate tax rates. Um, that doesn't make any sense. It's not an important issue uh, anymore, and you know we certainly are not you know, looking to lower personal taxes is like an, an important issue. If you wanted to lower taxes, maybe the payroll tax would be important. The other thing that I think we're more focused on is, for the most part, not, uh, not only, of course, do most people not pay the upper income bracket tax rate, but even the people that are nominally in that bracket don't pay it. Um, and that, I think, is actually a very interesting issue to think through all of the new ways of tax evasion and avoidance um, and figure out exactly how to deal with that. Um, because until you do that, again, um, you can have all the high, you can raise taxes all you want, um, and it won't have the effect you need. And it's very tough to build the kind of solidaristic uh, welfare state that you want if you can't actually get people to, um, to pay taxes. Do you want to weigh in on taxes? 
We also think people should stop evading taxes. We also find policy pretty boring too, probably. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, all right. So, uh, so okay. Um, talking a little bit about um, populism and wh who are the people. So, in in when you talk about American populism now, um, who are you talking about? I, I read your article, um, and you speak a lot about. I'm sorry, Gladden's article on the anxiety of American conservatives. Is that correct? Is that the title? Um, and you, you speak about uh, sort of the Reagan revolution in terms of the coalition that they were able to build between um, uh, people who were in favor of a liberal market and people who had more social, sort of social conservative values. Um, and essentially what that coalition did um, was bring in sort of the white middle class Democrats, right, into the Republican Party. Is that correct? So do you have a, tar who is your target audience for this populism that you're proposing? Um, yeah, I, 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 am, I, don't under, I don't understand that question. Um, in fact, I think that, um, um, I mean, the, the, it's pointless to speak about solid, the possibility of solidarity if we don't intend to include everyone in different aspects. Um, and my and my the, on, the only sort of general question I was intending to raise earlier, um, you know, for which I you know raised the question of um, the left talking about microaggressions, and of course, if I think about university campuses, I can't help being stuck on one. Um, but the question is, um, I mean, you know, there there are many different uh, right. I mean, we we already have a multiracial working class uh, and a multiracial society. And so, do we intend politically to do the thing to to present um, an, an 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 appeal to the American people as a whole uh, on uh, on important matters of economic policy, uh, foreign policy, and and uh, and the and the return of um, and the return of all questions to a kind to the possibility of political decision or not, and so it, it, sometimes sometimes in listening to the discussion thus far, uh, I don't really see what the issue is. Um, you know, w w we're not we're not arguing about what the 2016 campaign should have looked like. Um, in fact, we certainly, you know, as I think Julius was getting at, haven't ever addressed uh, immigration in the terms in which it was framed by the uh, by the Republican candidate in 2016. Um, and, and I would much rather have a debate over, you know, again, not not so much policy, uh, but on on the question of immigration. I would be much happier to to debate and discuss. Um, the different the different uh, social science questions that are that are that are that are raised and which and which are important uh, in order to frame correct policy on immigration, um, but you know, uh, again, sort of j just sort of dilating on the, on this on the on the question for another moment. Um, I mean, I see no reason why questions of policing. Uh, shouldn't be of importance to people on the right too. Again, if they take if, if they take their if, if they if they take their solidarity seriously, uh, and so I would be I would be very interested in in uh, in, in pushing the right uh, toward addressing those questions, and we hope to do so uh, in future issues. After all, we've had only two thus far, um, and. Um, to cite only a case that I happen to know a little bit about, which isn't an American one, um, but you know there was a very severe problem in policing in Northern Ireland at the time of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, uh, when the when the Royal Ulster Constabulary was a 98% Protestant organization, uh, policing uh, Catholic neighborhoods as well, and it was the and, and it was the it, and it was part of that initial what in that case was a religious disparity, uh, which had driven the formation. Uh, of sort of community policing organizations like the IRA. Um, that was a joke, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> an, 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 an initially, initially, a, um, initially a community policing organization. Um, and so they created a new policing service. They abolished their previous one. They abolished the Royal Ulster Constabulary and replaced it with the Police Service of Northern Ireland with the intention of making police forces representative of the communities that they, that they governed. Um, uh, but, it, but, but it seems to me um, that, um, that, that, that framing questions first in terms of potential solidarity that could be realized on a political level uh, versus first 
uh, first raising raising the uh, sort of obstacles to, to to that potential solidarity, obstacles such as the persistence of American racism, which still have to be confronted, could yield sort of different types of political outcomes. So what what uh, what um, what Sarah and Tim were describing earlier when they when they cited um, you know uh, e examples that they're more familiar with than I am um, of you know you know, particular uh, community or community or social groups that realize the kind of, you know, cross racial uh, class solidarity that they're envisioning. Um, I mean, is, 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 is the future one of, of, of potential real solidarity um, in, uh, on a political level? Uh, or is it simply, you know, or or will, or, 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 or will that be forever foreclosed to us um, by the need to sort of uh, confront all of the issues that stand in the way of that beforehand? So why don't you all respond and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I, so I guess something that's been earnestly sort of frustrating to me about your project is I also think that there are potential alliances to be made among people who are all being kind of screwed over, right? Um, and when I make arguments against the arguments that I perceive in your journal, what I'm trying to do is not condemn anyone who cast a ballot for Trump, actually. Um, and in fact, I'm interested in those people. Um, what I am criticizing is the way that I see this journal reacting to that political moment and trying to form an ideology from it that I think is, uh, rests on a faulty critique and is unproductive. And so one element of that that I found in our conversation is it's very clear, right, that in the last election, one coalition was overwhelmingly white and more male and one was more diverse and somewhat more female, right? This is Are you not- talking about Bernie versus Hillary? <laughs> ha ha ha, yes. Um, no. Um, I wasn't. Um, but yeah, one of the- one of the things that we sort of gathered from this election, right, was that there are people for whom a somewhat populist message resonates on the left or the right, and they can go either way. We can, we can, that's what organizing is, that's what political persuasion is. People can move left or right, and it's our job as political people on the left to hopefully persuade them um, that this analysis and this course of action is gonna be more successful. Um, so, I think when we talk about um, political constituencies, what's been frustrating for me is it seems like you guys can't see why those coalitions haven't already gotten together. There's like nothing standing in the way. Like why wouldn't they be on the same team? And that's confusing to me because it seems so obvious to me and I think almost everybody else. And you know, I think particularly this comes out in sort of bits and pieces, although it's largely not articulated, um, when you talk about constituencies and when you talk about identity politics, you refer to the left's alliance with urban progressive constituencies that lack real traction. Um, I wonder who that is, but the, but, but the frustrating thing, right, is that these sort of slippery alliances are the very work of the left, right? It's to put together people who have common interests but not necessarily common backgrounds to struggle against broadly capitalism, but more often like their landlord. Um, and it's frustrating to see that uh, coming from the right, there are no overtures like, oh, so, you know, we would love to have more help from the right on controlling police. That would be great. Go for it. Do, by all means, work on that issue. That'd be awesome. Um, well, we're trying to make an overture, <laughs> but it seems to be very hard. But you cannot do it. And this is what is so frustrating. No, you until won't, you won't you take yes for an answer. Grapple, Why don't you let her finish her comment and then you can Until respond. you are willing to grapple with what America actually looks like on the terms of the people who are not yourselves, which is just like a baffling omission from your journal. Um, and I think something that the left actually understands very well. When we talk about identity politics, and I'm so sick of the term, um, 
what we're saying, or you know, usually there's a critic's way of describing people, but people are saying that my particular group of people is oppressed in this particular way. And then other people, once they can see that, if we're doing good organizing, say, I want to be in solidarity with you to throw off that oppression, and I hope you'll be in solidarity with me. And that's how you build stuff, right? To frame identity politics as a dividing thing that, in your words, balkanize the country is no way to build any political coalition. And until you can see that, this coalition that you want can't exist. And this is just speaking of coalitions, the point about Bernie voters, um, a lot of old white dudes in that mix, it's a, good, it's, a point, it's a good one, a point well taken. And I think it points, unsurprisingly, to the strength of our argument because what you see is a campaign that wasn't based on a type of nationalist message of the type that American Affairs and certainly the Journal of American Greatness, the blog that preceded this journal, um, was so sympathetic to. What you saw with Bernie was an ability to get Trump-ish voters, uh, all those old white dudes on board, and then a legitimately diverse coalition. Bernie carried um, African Americans under the age of 30, just like he carried an overwhelming number as white people under the age of 30. That was um, something that defied the stereotype that was presented in the media, and that's why I have hope, especially as significant as those Trump voters are now, they're not getting any younger. And if you want to win an election, not just in 2020, but in 2030, 2040, 2050, you need to be looking ahead. And when I thinking about the future brings me back to the present and the possible point I made in the introduction, the consequences of not taking a strong stance on Trump now, it's not a choice that you, it's a choice that's being thrust upon us. And this is, if you want to make this alliance, you can't avoid that question. And what I'm especially worried about for American Affairs, I mean, I start off by saying that one of the things I admired about the journal was your astute, astute diagnosis of the total corruption of the Republican Party establishment. And Gladden, you point out that this DC infrastructure has been built on a lie, essentially, this insane notion that the Tea Party just wanted, I think Dave Frum made this point, that the Tea Party was only about the Wall Street Journal editorial board policy, right? You understand this was a canard that people were telling themselves. Republicans didn't understand what their voters wanted. That was something that was led inevitably to 2016. What I don't want to see happen is you guys make the same mistake about Trump voters now and misinterpret this year in which white people learn to love identity politics as an embrace of nationalism when it was just operating in a profoundly different register. Once we have that conversation and can agree on those common facts, then we can move forward potentially together, but not until then. Well, we, we've, we've, we've spoken against any formation of white identity politics ad infinitum, um, so I won't do it again. But I think um, to some extent it's very puzzling to us because we actually don't care about the Republican Party, but you guys still seem to care a lot about the Democratic Party. And it's puzzling because we've gone through it and um, we have seen the incredible disconnect between the rhetoric and the institutions that we're supposed to admire. For instance, oh, you know, how great the entrepreneurs are and, um, and, and, and things like that, but it turns out they're all just a bunch of rent seekers. Uh, but it seems that the left hasn't recognized that, you know, your heroic regulators aren't really regulating anything. Um, they're just rent seekers too, and they're gonna go and join the companies that they supposedly regulate um, as their first chance. Uh, the ultimate left institutions, the universities, are engaged in a vicious war against Graduate student unionization. Indeed, I've heard it from an employee of Harvard that they're actually waiting for more employees, more uh, commissioners on the NLRB from Republicans before they uh, press the issue. Um, and, and we've gone through all of that with the, the right institutions and we see what a joke it is. Um, and, and hopefully maybe um, you'll see that's a joke too. And what this project is not about, it's, not, it's never been about justifying the Trump administration or anything like that. It's trying to set out a new version, a new vision that leaves all this stuff behind. And I think whatever one thinks of Trump, he did create this moment or this moment, this, he provoked this moment and we have to try to take advantage of it uh, in a new way. And that's what we're trying to do. 
everybody finds a reason not to act politically, it seems to me. Um, and on the, on, on, the, on the notional right, this consists in a basically intentional strategy of removing the things that they care about, namely the market, from any kind of political intervention. And apparently on the left, what it consists in uh, is not allowing us ever to get to the point that we look at the things that oppress everyone equally um, in, fa in, in, in favor of setting up a, a you know, relentless series of conflicts that we all have to go through, uh, which will end in what you know then we'll get then we'll get to then we'll get to class solidarity again i mean not to dwell on the not to dwell on the northern ireland example but you know two years before the good friday agreement you've still got bombs going off in england and bombs going off in northern ireland and not that not that everything is perfect there um but they but they but but they, but they at least chose a i mean maybe ironically the left uh, at least in, its, in the form of its current spokesman here, um, lacks a sufficient attention to conflict resolution uh, because the, the strategy that Sarah outlined is basically, um, well, before we ever get to addressing the way that um, uh, currency exchange markets uh, can immediately affect uh, all the possessors of a certain currency, first we have to have uh, a block by block um, you know, in a seri series of uh, con not conflict resolution, but conflicts. And that's the part that amazes me um, because, uh, I mean, all, all, that, uh, all that I intend to do, at least for the moment, um, is call attention to the issues which should have some sort of political, uh, political bearing put on them if indeed we live in a democracy. Uh, and that includes all the issues that uh, all the issues that we've raised. Um, and e even before you get to the point of saying that, um, you know, say our immigration policy should be X or Y, first, don't you have to have some sort of democratic control over your actual polity, uh, which would also go hand in hand with having that with having that polity be able to be able to act um, with with respect to determining what its economic future would be like. Uh, and so my only concern from the, from from the discussion is that is that we shouldn't introduce conflict uh, where there might be some path for conflict resolution. Uh, and the great thing about conflict resolution is that you still have to acknowledge what the conflict is. Really quickly, really quickly. Um, I wanted to make just a quick point of clarification, which is that I don't think either um, me or Tim has any particular position in defense of the Democratic Party. And in fact, I haven't been accused of that in a long time. So thank you for making me seem respectable again. Um, and in fact, I recently published an article excoriating the president of Harvard University for her labor policies. So I don't know if we would recognize those institutions as being of the left. Um, and then I would just say to Gladden, having raised the um, seemingly innocently the question of why do we have to have all these conflicts? Why can't we just have unity within the working class? Man, there is some historiography I could introduce you to because we've been asking these questions for a while. And I think uh, it, it's, it's a comfortable position to be able to ask why can't we have unity within the, within the working class that the left has been working on for kind of a while um, and that we actually have developed some strategies for, but it has, of course, been shaped profoundly by America's legacy, not just of slavery and anti-black racism, but of immigration and all of the complicated social forces that shaped the US. Um, and it does sound as if you guys might like to come over to the left and learn some stuff, like you're new to the terrain. We've been working on this shit, you know, come on over. All right, thank you. Um, so let's open it up for questions. Um, keep your questions to questions and not statements. Uh, so I will cut you off if you start making declarative statements. So um, let's do three uh, questions at a time. Um, you know, keep it clean, folks. You know, there are children somewhere maybe watching this. Um, uh, you know, n no ad hominem attacks. Let's just be decent for t 30 minutes. Um, okay. <laughs> Do you want to take a moment? So three questions and then we'll do a wrap. Do you want to sure. uh, can everyone raise their hands if you have a question? I'll point to three. I think this calls for a progressive stack. We'll learn what that is. One, is that it? Two, can you come up? 
And three, cool. Hello. Thank you. And if your question is directed to somebody, just mention their name. Uh, this is not to anybody in particular, but it's to the American Affairs side. Um, I think there was a question posed earlier, which was, who's the target audience for your populism? And I would ask, uh, what is the binding force of your populism? So insofar as I can detect something new in the kind of nationalism you're proposing, it, it mostly seems to be gestural. The right these days talks about Baudrillard. I see Gramsci quoted on the right a lot. There's an attack on neoliberalism. Um, but what would preserve nationalism this time around, if not ethnic or racial identity that didn't preserve civic nationalism the last time it was tried in this country? That's the question. Thank you. I'm an anti-abortion uh, socialist Roman Catholic. Um, and I'm curious, my question is for Sarah and for Tim. At what point would you join a political coalition that was more culturally right-wing or less culturally left-wing, but say more economically left-wing? So at what point do the economic questions trump the cultural ones for you? You know, where does that happen? How absolute are they? How does, how does that relate? And we can probably add one more on the stack. Any women? Yeah, um, to the um, American Affairs guys, you were using the word working class solidarity, I think you even said, and I'm really curious what you actually mean by that. Um, and to the dissent folks, if I may ask you, what do you think the value is of rhetorical moral blackmail? Let's start with that one. So on that point, it depends on who you're blackmailing. On the question of um, cultural issues versus um, economic issues, I don't think that politics works that way. I think it's impossible to make a statement about something like that in the abstract, but to the extent that the left stands for anything, it stands for emancipation, and that's a battle that's worth fighting, and that's not something, <laughs> luckily it's not an issue that I think we're gonna be presented with anytime soon. But Sarah, you probably have more astute commentary on the actual tactics of politics. Um, no, I, I would echo that, that you, of course, can't separate them, and so it becomes a negotiation, right? So abortion politics is a perfect example, wherein it's often framed as a cultural issue, but obviously, if I'm forced against my will to bear a child, it will upend not only my emotional, but my economic life. So, you know, there's always a negotiation. Um, I mean, this happens less, le sorry, less on the left um, and more within the Democratic Party, but, there's always this negotiation between um, pro-life Democrats and the rest of the party. The sort of detente that's usually reached is you can hold those politics, but you don't impose them on anyone else. I mean, the, the, those things are, are inseparable, and I think it often depends on sort of where you stand, whether you can see how they're linked up. Um, and so, of course, within any growing coalition, those are actually going to be tensions. Someone sees it as economic, someone sees it as cultural, um, and you, that it's, it's messy. These coalitions are messy, um, but economics and culture are not separate. Just one follow-up point on that. Just, just like following off of like Gladden's article, which just declared an end to at least one phase of the culture wars, it seems like when the left is gaining traction on the subject, now isn't the time that we have to start making compromises on that front. These are battles that we've already won. It doesn't seem like we have to go backwards. And thinking um, about American Affairs contributor Michael Anton, his, as I'm sure some of the people in this room know, uh, he wrote this article called The Flight 93 Election, right, that came out before the election went kind of viral. The thesis of the piece was that, and he's a proud Trump supporter, he said that in this election, you either change the cockpit or you die, that the right was in such a tenuous position, among other reasons, because the left kept on winning these cultural battles. So, and that's the case, I feel like I don't need to get in the way of a good thing. Any question about uh, the boundary, the binding force of your populism? 
what is the binding force of your populism? And then, uh, what do you mean by the working? What, what do you mean by working class solidarity? Um, I took that question kind of more in the sense of the binding force of citizenship generally, um, and we can get very philosophic about it, but. I'm perfectly content to just take legal citizens right now, today, uh, and a desire to see that the elected American government, elected by those citizens, actually looks after the interests of those citizens. And yes, that includes all those citizens, um, but I'm content with just legal American citizenship right now. Um, the binding force of your, is legal citizenship. If you're a legal citizen, then you are a part of this movement. Is that what you, is that the answer to the I don't know if you're a part of the movement. I don't know what the movement even is. What I'm saying is that the point is that legal citizenship means something more than a formality, um, that it becomes the primary identity, if you will, and it is the primary basis on which government uh, policy is evaluated, um, as opposed to abstract notions of globalism and so forth. I'm not understanding your answer. Are you saying so civic engagement is what you're looking to foster? Yes. I, I guess that helps. Uh, <laughs> I just need to know the right cliche. Um, but uh, what was <laughs> what was the other question? Oh, uh, working class solidarity. I think glad news that we're all alternate him. But I, I think it's basically just a, a, a sense of a consciousness of more economic issues that unite the entire uh, class, um, as opposed to say cultural divides and other issues. I. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the only, the only supplement I would add to, to Julius's first answer is, I mean, the, uh, the citizens are members of a state, and so as long as we have a nation state, which we claim has some sort of democratic basis, I don't remember who I'm addressing now, um, as long as we have a, an, an, uh, as long as we have a nation state which claims to have some sort of democratic basis, then it should assert itself and act in the manner that nation states do. Otherwise, we should have, we should abolish it and have some other form of political organization. Um, no, that's fine. That's, that's fine. See, I mean, but, but, but when's the last time, when's the last time you heard, you heard somebody on the right state that? You know, I think it's. I don't think anyone talks like that, actually. Um, and 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 so, if 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 our discussion has had made one thing clear, it's that often the stakes of political debates are not clear at all. Um, and the, the questioner was was very right to pose to pose the question in order to clarify it. Uh, and the answer is that we have a nation state, and either we should continue to have it or we should abolish it. But we never talk. But we never talk about that. So at least left and right can agree. Uh, that instead we try to dance around it, um, you know, by um, in, in in all in all the ways that politicians do. Oh, and about and 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 about and about um, what is what is what is working class solidarity? Um, I, again, do we want people to have jobs, and do we want them to uh, have a future which or do we want to have a future that ordinary people would want to be a part of? Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that threaten the very existence of the working class. First, that there are a lot of people who don't work at all, and a lot of people who, um, uh, who simply put together strings of part-time jobs uh, in order to try to make a living. Uh, and there are a lot of people whose jobs are going to be subject to probably some other waves of automation, which we are told, again, in a non-political non manner, that according to the laws of economics, um, the replacement of people by machines is always good because it simply frees them up to do something else. Um, it, it, we, have, we really have no idea whether that uh, will hold in the next round of automation or not. Maybe it will, or maybe it will, it, maybe it will turn people uh, toward doing all sorts of jobs that they don't actually want to do. Um, and that's my answer to the question. More questions? Test. Oh, okay. One, two. Hey, um, in dis uh, defining working class solidarity, you talked about legal American citizenship. Um, it strikes me that since your journal is based around nationalism, that's a kind of cold way to define the project. Uh, traditionally, people who've written about nationalism have written about what it means to them on a sort of more romantic level, 
uh, or at least in terms of the values they feel that they can get to through nationalism specifically, what does nationalism mean to you? Hi, I was curious, who would you like to see run in 2020? Open question. Yeah. All right, um, I have two questions uh, for our friends on, on the right. Um, so the critique, I, w I wonder if you could go a little bit beyond when, when you talked about critiquing neoliberalism, is that a critique of capitalism? Um, and what, you know, how do you see, what do you see as the main prongs of ways to confront some of the problems that you were talking about, strings of part-time jobs and all of that sort of stuff um, around neoliberalism? And then um, on the left, as someone who has consider, considers myself to, a leftist, I, I did feel sometimes a little bit um, uncomfortable with the only calls for building um, broad solidarity coming from the right. And not because I don't understand, I do very much understand why we also need to be looking at issues related to gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, et cetera. But I would like you to speak a little bit more about class and where you see that fitting in and how to build class solidarity in a way that perhaps also takes into account a large percentage of the Trump voters. Uh, can we have one more question, Miriam? Sure. Actually, just a quick piggyback off of that. Okay. Um, well, we have it on live stream. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think the question was why nationalism is important. Is that the right way to say it? Just to piggyback, um, how do you think nationalism, both practically and symbolically, is significant or insignificant or will be? So just to discuss nationalism a little bit more specifically. And how do you fix? How do you fix the? Sure. Oh, sorry. So, um, is your critique of neoliberalism also a critique of capitalism? And how do? What are some suggested fixes for neoliberalism? Yeah, basically it is. Um, but I do think one area the right might be helpful to the left um, is we do have to understand the reality, and I think a lot of the left does, but. What we're confronting is not Adam Smith, 18th century capitalism. Um, I have called it managerialism. You know, uh, there are other names for it, but uh, it's a very peculiar form of corporate uh, capitalism in which the multinational corporation um, becomes, in a way, uh, the more powerful body than the sovereign state. Um, leading to all the things that we discussed previously. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of different policies. Um, I, don't, I guess the only thing I would, uh, you know, aside from the traditional welfare state items that we've already sort of discussed and endorsed, um, I do think uh, there, there are some, you know, the one area that maybe the, the right might be a little bit helpful is understanding, much like how the right has to understand that just because something's a corporation and private sector doesn't mean it's creative and, and helpful. Um, in the same way, I think sometimes the left has relied too much on sort of uh, nonprofit litigation and kind of an expert technical technocrat driven um, attempt to curb these organizations which actually only ends up making them stronger uh, and really the only way to do it, it, it ends up and I, I, I apologize for retreating into cliches again but in the interest of time um, a more sort of democratic uh, populist populist base um, repoliticization of these issues um, as a way to uh, to restore some of the things we want Um, the most, I was just going to say for those who are asking questions on uh, nationalism, as far as I can tell, the only recent political as assertion of nationalism was not actually the American campaign of 2016, but Brexit. Uh, and the best article on Brexit was published in Dissent magazine about a year ago called The Left Case for Brexit, um, which is also a piece which is, is not driven by 
um, sort of romantic uh, assertions of, you know, cloudy visions of what uh, being British really ought to mean, um, but about a very practical question that if one has any political goals, be they left political goals or right political goals, uh, Britain's membership in, in uh, a, a a uh, political institution which was designed to, in part, to remove uh, political issues from popular uh, processes of decision making, uh, then the initial way to respond to that is through reasserting political sovereignty. Um, and so I refer you to that article. Well, um, so yes, we'll take the clicks. Thank you for that, Gladden. Um, on the point of, actually, and before I talk about solidarity, which I do want to get to, uh, just want to second, well, point out to Julius, it's like, yes, we're with you on the limits of liberal technocracy and the efficacy of like leading in as a solution to class struggle or any problem worth actually addressing. Like this is a conversation that we've been having on our side for quite a while and something that again was one of the reasons why I thought this is a conversation that would be worth having for us. On the point of class, on the point of class solidarity and um, the, and so, and so bringing in Trump voters and really sort of like the aversion and point that Gladden and Julius, I think you guys made in different uh, capacities as well, sort of aversion to dividing up a coalition before we've actually built one. Point taken. Um, this conversation that we're having tonight isn't the type of conversation that we always need to have. There are different moments politically where you focus on different issues. I'll just say that for me politically, one of the most decisive moments of my formation, though it came pretty late in the game, was Occupy, and we are the 99%. And in terms of mobilizing a coalition that is trying to bring in as broad a group as possible, 99% seems like a pretty hefty number to me. And again, this is not, it's not a cure-all. We don't have an Occupy president right now, but if we're, we don't, I also don't think we need to go that far, look, into that dissonant corner to find models of potential left strategies that could be very effective. Yeah, and, um, and we're supposed to say who we want in 2020. Yeah, I, um, do you have a good one for well, that? I'd think. Yeah. Well, I'd say I think one lesson to take from 2016 is that you shouldn't think too far ahead about these things. <laughs> My initial reaction is like, oh God, anyone but Chelsea. But. <laughs> I will say that it seems like the DNC has made sure that Keith Ellison is going to have a lot of free time on his hands, which could be interesting. That could be fun. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, on uh, neoliberalism and capitalism, I would say yes for us. Also, this is a critique of capitalism, certainly. Um, and I guess probably in one minute, I, I will not attempt to give my full analysis of why capitalism is bad, but I will say that. Um, sort of touching on the things we've discussed today beyond expropriating the wealth of people who do the work. Um, something that capitalism does is impoverish our community lives by making sure no one has time to do anything except to work. And it sucks. And it's like a shitty way to be human. Um, and so there's an affective level of this as well and one that plays into a lot of the community questions we're discussing, which capitalism is incompatible with. Um, and on the class question, I think that's a great question. And I was actually feeling a bit that way myself because we're usually having these debates with liberals. And so we're the ones talking about class the entire time and they're telling us that, you know, whatever leaning in is good. Um, and <laughs> literal quote. <laughs> it happens. Um, but but so I, I'm glad that you raised it and something that I think a lot of people on the left are thinking about and something that we uh, frequently argue about with liberals. You know, there's a lot of, I think, admittedly terrible rhetoric from liberals during the election um, about how, you know, those coal miners were going to get their comeuppance when they realized that their Trump candidate was actually going to cut their health insurance. And that's disgusting. And I want to be clear that that's disgusting. Um, and so something on the left that we have to think a lot about is, so if you take coal miners as an example, um, coal mining is extremely hard work that is bad for your health. And one of the reasons it's so bad for your health and for the environment is that it's run by a bunch of capitalists who are incredibly irresponsible and abusive towards their workforce. Um, and so something that's an interesting project for the left right now, and there's a lot of new thinking on this, is how do we make an energy transition that's compatible with climate change and the larger sort of like global issues that we face and is beneficial 
beneficial to the workers who are, through no fault of their own, are gonna have to make a job transition of some kind? How do we, how do we make sure those people have money and work if they want work? I care more about giving people money than work, but, um, and that's, a, that, that's absolutely crucial for what building the coalition is gonna look like and what the policy agenda of that coalition is. Any candidates you'd like to throw out there, nominate for 2020? I'm not, I'm not gonna name any specific individuals because I don't wanna doom their campaign immediately. Is um, <laughs> but I would like to see a candidate, and I don't care who it is, and I don't care which party they're in, but that understands the underlying issues um, that played out uh, in different ways in both the Trump and Sanders campaign, and who understands the uh, good parts of that and what, what unites them, um, and is able to focus on a, a radically different politics um, uh, that f deals with the challenges we face now, rather than refighting and relitigating the battles of the 1990s that don't even matter anymore. So, Kanye 2020. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think he's a friend of Trump, so maybe you gotta be careful. Mm, let's do two more questions, really short ones. Anybody? A lot right, of hands. Down in the front. Um, oh. We need a mic, sorry. Sorry, you want an answer to the nationalism question? Yeah, yeah just, Did they not um, answer it? just yeah. an actual answer to the straight up question, what does nationalism mean to you? Forget the fact that the person asking you has a British sorry. accent. <laughs> Don't need to know about Brexit. Okay. What does nationalism Thank mean you. to you? Thank you. I, 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 I suspect Gladden, had that answer, he would have given that answer no matter who asked the question, um, because it's, the essay is just that good. Um, but I, I actually do, I want to echo his point, and I want to actually state, I, I don't want to get into all of these um, cultural uh, flourishes about nationalism. Um, I think that actually is where nationalism can go very astray, as we saw with German nationalism, which got into the very romantic elements and soon, of course, much worse. Um, I think it's much better to simply focus on the real practic practical sort of Anglo-American British sense of nationalism, which tends to be very concrete, very um, simple, uh, very very pra pragmatic, uh, and that's that's the vision I have. Maybe you can ask a follow-up afterwards. Okay, two two quick questions. Hi, I have a question for um, for Julius. Um, you mentioned Sanders, and I wanted to know what were your um, what, were, uh, what do you think the limitations of his campaign were? Okay, one more. Um, I guess my question is, uh, you know, one of the reasons, uh, uh, you know, e everyone uh, on this dais obviously are, you know, dedicated to to real inquiry, um, and one of the reasons Trump was elected is because he doesn't sit on uh, on panels like this, uh, because he is not question, dedicated. Question, question, question. What's your um, question? So my question is, how, how do we how do we form like a politics that can really kind of get the narratives? back to things that are grounded in like actual reality and that can't be kind of just just dismissed so kind of quickly. How do, how do we bring credibility kind of back into the political realm? Okay, uh, so let's ta start with Sanders. What were the limitations of his campaign? I think his biggest limitation was running in the Democratic Party, um, which was too strong to be taken over by an outsider uh, as the, Repu you know, the Republican was too weak uh, to resist one. Um, and, and how, do we, how do we refocus? I, I have no idea, um, but I think it, it doesn't make sense to kind of be too, par I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, what if this fails and stuff? And it's like, I don't care. Um, it's still worth doing. Uh, so just the only way to do it is if we actually start doing it and sort of get out of these uh, conventions. Um, and I know that's probably the, the most uh, kind of dreamy leftish thing I'll ever say, um, but here's the place to do it, I guess. Um, but I, I don't know any other way. And, if we worry about it, um, we will never do it. Why don't we go to this side quickly? Yeah, just um, in terms of like having a grounded politics, providing plausible solutions to problems that people face in their everyday life. Like that's what politics should always be about. And then linking those practical solutions to larger visions of social change. And actually this is, I'll be brief about this, but it's a point that I worry about with the American Affairs Project where 
I think that technocracy and populism share more in common than the analysis so far has allowed. I think that they're two sides of a really shitty coin and that a properly functioning democracy would have a place for an option that was better than either of those. And I think that building a coherent ideological politics, which is something that is obviously a concern of intense, it's an issue of intense concern for us, that's what democracy at its best can look like. And that's a project that we in our non running for office capacities are dedicating ourselves to. Yeah, um, I mean, I assume that you are here because you think it's worthwhile um, and want to debate these questions because they feel urgent. And it certainly are, um, you know, part of our job to to sort of at least try to facilitate that. I mean, I I think in terms of creating narratives that resonate with people, um, to refer back to Occupy, actually. Um, something that sort of charmed me that that happened during that time was. Previously, people had not talked a lot about their, their personal debt, and it was a subject of a lot of shame. It's still a subject of a lot of shame. Um, and one of the small bits of Occupy was this Tumblr that someone made, where people were posting pictures of themselves holding up signs that said their debt on it, you know, like $50,000 of medical debt, and holding it up or holding it up in front of their face. Some people, you know, really were ashamed. And it, it created the idea of debt as a collective problem instead of an individual problem. It's not your fault. And that was an incredible renovation in our politics at that time um, and had a, had a tremendous emotional effect on a lot of people, I think, and has only grown since. And what we saw with the Sanders campaign, some of what resonated was actually speaking to those realities in a really blunt way without euphemism. You know, you're in debt, rich people took your money from you, and you should have free college because you're a person. You should be educated, you should be able to flourish. Um, and that's the sort of practicality combined with a vision that I think Tim is talking about and that I think we hope to pursue, um, and that is really a community in itself, the pursuit of those goals. Um. <clears throat> So I'm not sure if the, I'm not sure in retrospect if this has become a point of confusion, but populism is not the description. Populism in the title, well now it's our picture, but populism, like the title was populism in the age of Trump, that does not translate as American affairs in the age of Trump. Populism is a phenomenon. Uh, it's not the campaign platform per se of every article in the issue of every, of, of every article in our issues, you know, which have you know diverse subject matter and I I, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't I don't see the I, I don't see for example the phenomenon of populism in the very um, you know complicated discussion of how electricity markets work in issue two so I, I at, at, at some point at some point I feel that term got disconnected from you know it, its place as a political phenomenon in the US and Europe during an age of you know, during the current stage of sort of neoliberal political hegemony and got applied to us. Um, and so second, the only, the, the, in, in response to the question, I, which I take to be the what do we do question, um, there, was an early, and there, there was an earlier remark that, uh, well, maybe these guys are just throwing around like names like Baudrillard in order to, you know, win some sort of, um, you know, sympathy with the audience, but there were there there, there were two specific parts of Baudrillard's project um, that, of course, as 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 the way as happens when one reads any political writer, um, as a political person oneself, get modif get modified. And the two parts that the two parts that I take from him uh, and obviously apply in probably different ways, uh, but are but 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 are something that I think I, I share with the lefts. Um, active sense of political possibility is is one which Baudrillard had a relentless um, diagnosis of all the things that stand in the way of political change, whatever that may be. And he was a very pessimistic person on that account, particularly because of his media theory, which is something I'm also interested in. We could have a discussion about maybe our next discussion. Um, and then, and nevertheless, through his concept of, rever of reversibility, uh, a sense that nevertheless, some sort of radical political change is actually possible. Uh, and, 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 and how we could, how we could say that that's 
I mean, there seems to be more evidence for that, for that uh, now than ever, not only in the American case, but also in cases like Brexit. Also, even with the triumph of the fanatical center in France through a party which didn't exist a year ago and, 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 and a, by French standards, ridiculously young uh, presidential candidate. Um, so uh, I, I think a first step, you know, not to be trite, is, is to uh, attempt to give speeches before diverse audiences consisting of those who are not necessarily one's normal political allies. Um, and so I think everyone's done that today. Okay, great. Um, thank you to all our panelists, to Dissent, to Nation, to American Affairs, to Verso. Um, it was interesting. Um, and thanks to all of you. That's it, we're done.